Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today um, with this panel that's going to be about generative art. And I have two amazing artists here today that it's very exciting. They've actually been exhibiting at the Digital Art Fair. So today I have with me um, Charles Sanderson, who is an amazing artist. Um, I believe, if you correct me if you're wrong, um, Charles, you were born from the United Kingdom. Um, and your practice visualizes paradoxical complexities and simplicities of human connection, behavior, and social structures through use of symbolic nature. Um, and then we as well have Daniel Conagar, who is a multidisciplinary artist who focuses on photography, video, and ins installation art. His practice um, focuses on technology's impact on humans and the way it manifests in the world. And both of their artworks in the show today, um, show that you've been visiting at, have been using um, generative art practices and generative in nature. So for this first part of the talk, we're actually extremely lucky to have these artists here and they're gonna give a little bit of an overview of their practice in the artwork that's on display in Hong Kong. So Daniel, if you wanna be um, the first one to jump right into it this early morning, we'd love to hear about your work and practice. Thank you, Abigail. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's good to, to join you all here. Um, so yes, my, my practice um, as an artist, I, I initially in my 20s and early 30s started out with photography and photo installation. <laughs> that uh, gradually evolved to the use of video, um, kind of immersive video environments and in, you know, video installation, also thinking of moving image in very sculptural ways. And eventually, um, now I'm fully immersed in the generative aspect of, of working with, with algorithms and working with, um, uh, yeah, basically with programming. So um, I'm totally addicted to generative art now. It's really hard to go back to, to video. Um, it's, there's just so many elements of it that I, I'm just totally fascinated with. And perhaps what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you all um, uh, one of the works that I'm displaying and I'm showing at the, um, at the digital art fair in Hong Kong. Let me just switch here to sh share screen. Um, and this is kind of an example of my most recent work. Um, it's a series, my most recent uh, digital, uh, <laughs> sorry, generative work. Let me just do a full screen here. Uh, it's a series that I call Pixel Weaver. Um, and what we basically did in the studio is that we, we uh, decided to create a, a loom, a digital loom that would allow us to feed different kinds of information, uh, different spools, I would say, of information. Now, one of the interesting things uh, about this project was to discover the, the kind of uh, history of the very kind of tight relationship between algorithms and, and textiles. For example, the Jacquard loom, which basically triggered the industrial revolution in the early 19th, in the early, uh, 19th century, uh, sorry, the early, yes, the early 19th century, 1803, 1804, um, is basically considered the first computer with its punch cards, giving the instructions of the patterns for, for textiles. So, um, and many other connections, including the interlaced lines of, of uh, you know, uh, cathode ray television screens. Um, there's just a very rich connection between algorithms and and um, textiles. In many ways, I kind of think of screens, modern day screens as a as a as a textiles, as a, a manifestation of the long legacy of of the textiles. I started looking at ancient uh, textiles and was very kind of um, struck by uh, pre-Columbian um, textiles, particularly from the Chan Kai uh, tribe uh, in the in Peru. Um, and how different weaving patterns had different symbolisms. This was, I thought, was an incredibly interesting kind of um, awareness of the media itself and thinking of myself as an artist where I'm making so much kind of meta reference to the media of, of, of algorithmic art, it just became very inspiring. So kind of bridging the, the ancient form of textiles with um, these kind of digital loom where I'm filling, you know, 
feeding into the artwork live data. Um, this just has become a in very interesting uh, process for me. So here we're seeing Chiron, uh, where I'm feeding the tickers, the news, cable news tickers um, from many different cable news channels live. I'm feeding it into the, this digital loom. And it's creating this very kind of chaotic frayed textile, a textile that kind of shows the social fabric of the of the, of the world of news that doesn't quite coalesce, that doesn't kind of weave into a coherent textile. This a textile that's full of holes and gaps and ripples and um, kind of thinking of like the the. The, the fake news and, and 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 this kind of world that we live in now, the, the news is so kind of dissonant. We also have Abacus, which is um, the work that I'm displaying at the art fair uh, that is very much inspired in the old financial ticker tapes. In this case, Abacus is also using real-time financial data, uh, weaving into this very kind of structured textile that is maybe rem reminiscent of the uh, bunching up in the branching of like cables and servers and communication systems and diagrams, electric diagrams. And finally, there's tunica, which is kind of a, a smaller piece uh, where I am weaving together uh, on the on the vertical, the, the, the warps, I'm about the names of people that died in, in Madrid where I'm based during COVID and the names of people that were born on the horizontal line. So this kind of delicate balance of life and death with the names of people that were born and the names of people that were that died, this is kind of creating this, this kind of live textile of, of, of kind of a, a tribute to, to the kind of the crazy times that we experienced in the last few years. So this is this, is, uh, this, is this project um, that, I, that I'm calling Pixel Weaver that will continue to evolve, um, and perhaps uh, in the few minutes that I that remain, I'll show you my another another recent project that's um, called Wayward, also a generative project. Uh, Wayward is also kind of thinking a lot about the news, the trauma of watching the news these days. I think it's uh, as a news addict. Um, I'm, I'm finding it increasingly hard to, to kind of process the news. So I decided to create this algorithmic generative project called Wayward that turns the photojournalistic images of the moment um, into instant art. So Wayward is an artwork that is creating artworks. And it's really composing uh, kind of uh, these images referencing a lot of the kind of the artistic uses of photojournalism from the 1960s and 1970s. So I'm thinking of Robert Rauschenberg, I'm thinking of Andy Warhol, of Martha Rossler, and so many other artists that started incorporating photographs lifted from the news and silk screening them onto their canvases, painting over them, repeating them, and all kinds of half-tone, mechanically produced um, images that were kind of being processed as art. But I'm also adding the digital uh, realm, the, the digital pixelated noise. I'm very interested in noise. And yeah, as the news are happening, and when I when the opening of the opening in September, September the eighth, uh, for this project and the show I had here in Madrid, um, it was interesting that the news of the of the Queen of England broke, and suddenly there was a big commotion in the room where this piece was being showed because people were literally getting the news through through the artwork, but processing. Processing current events through art has become a very kind of therapeutic um, process for me. And, and this is uh, me kind of creating these kind of brush strokes. There's uh, over 300 brush strokes uh, uh, that were recorded and that are uh, um, kind of appear in different shapes and colors and enormous a variety of brush strokes where I'm able to kind of literally paint digitally paint over the artwork. We have over 600 different rules uh, in this work. So even though it looks very kind of um, arbitrarily composed, it's actually probably one of the most 
composed works I have I have ever I have ever done. This creates up to seven million different combinations of potential um, uh, arrangements of images, including, of course, the, the the photographs of the moment. This is real time feeds that just create an incredible variety of of images. And this is one of the magic of of working with with generative art. It's just these kind of random kind of poetic automatic poetry that kind of appears it's just completely uh surprising and how i really feel and perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about that how generative art seems to be more connected to um performance art to me and live theater than than say with this history of moving image so i think that's a little more than five minutes so i'll pass it on to you abigail thank you Amazing, and thank you. I think this is a lovely base for our discussion that will start um, shortly. Um, Charles, would you like to give a few words on your artistic practice as well? Oh, I think we're, we have you on mute. There we go. Hello. Okay, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever or whatever you are. Uh, my name is Charles Sanderson, and uh, it's very nice to be invited to this uh, webinar. And uh, I apologize now for uh, trying to explain what my work is and what it looks like, because half the time I'm not even sure myself. So uh, um, I'm participating in the the art fair with with a specific piece. So if uh, I can get that running uh, a video piece. I can talk over it and a little bit give you insight into what I'm trying to do. So uh, let's see. Can you can you share that for me now? All right. Okay. Somebody somebody. This is a real Wizard of Oz thing. So yeah, I don't know how fluid how fluid that looks, but uh, this this is a piece which is. Uh, um, based on uh, it's an algorithm which is uh, like, for example, when somebody's uh, been lost or gone missing, and uh, the police have to uh, uh, recreate uh, the person's sort of face based on some little bit uh, uh, contemporary photograph. Um, I, I've created an algorithm that. Uh, would sort of reverse a process and age somebody backwards to uh, potentially uh, an infantile state. Uh, the the characters, uh, the, the face appears, and instead of pixels, uh, I'm using uh, characters. And um, I, I write the code myself. That's my my what I call my kind of happy place. Uh, usually, I'm very antisocial and I, I don't like people very much and. But I'm, I'm really happy when I'm coding. That's for me, uh, it's both a meditation. It's almost like an oracle. Uh, I write in C and C++ and various, various other languages. Um, I'm a bit, I guess I'm a bit of a freak because uh, I taught myself to program when I was about 12 years old. Uh, and I, my first computer I got in like 1981, which is, you know, that's, that's a little too long ago to be to be uh, to be comfortable with in terms of how many years have passed. And uh, I, I grew up in the remote part of the north of Scotland, and uh, uh, it was quite difficult to you know travel anywhere. Um, I was you know basically living on a mountain uh, with my hippie parents, and uh, you know I, if I wanted to see a friend, I would have to travel for you know, like 20, 30 kilometers if I wanted to see another human fence, face, beg your pardon. And uh, so so with this little computer, which had 1K of memory and black and white graphics, it was, you know, you couldn't go to the store to buy a video game or something like that. If you wanted to do it to do anything interesting, you had to sort of program it yourself. And so that's why I, I kind of taught myself to program. And... Uh, you know, I, growing up, through, especially through teenage years, it was a little bit like, you know, you go to high school and you deal with all of those kind of pubescent kind of angst and issues and trials and tribulations. And then I, I would go home after a particularly long bus ride back up the mountain and I would open my computer and I would start coding. And it was a little bit like a, like a therapy. It was a way of 
you know, if it was literally the only thing I could talk to. And it, the computer almost became a kind of like a little bit like Oracle of Delphi. It was a way to somehow uh, both blank my mind, but also be, be creative. Of course, I, I didn't know this. This had no connection with art and art making and art practice. I used to actually sell to make money. I sold, uh, you know, in the 8-bit computer market days of the 1980s, I used to sell games. And uh, um, I was delighted to find out recently some of my early artwork to code games are in the sort of Cambridge His Museum of Computing History, which was, you know, the one thing I'm particularly proud of, not so much about where my contemporary artworks are in museums, but I, I, I like where my 8-bit kind of uh, uh, games are. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, um, I, I then uh, so went to study quite classical art, in fact, in Glasgow School of Art, uh, first of all, painting, and then I kind of evolved into more photography. And it wasn't until the very end of my sort of education that I realized that, um, you know, writing computer programs is exactly the same kind of uh, writing algorithms and generative art. It's the exact same kind of feeling that I had when I was painting. It was kind of, like, again, this, it's like a mind place. It's a place you go to, to, to focus your thoughts and organize your ideas, whether it's on a canvas or a photograph or a sculpture. But for me, it's in in the lines of code. It's like a, I shut my eyes and I can I can I can somehow see reality. And uh, I got very interested in um, a thing called uh, uh, artificial life, specifically a set of algorithms by uh, uh, a mathematician called Chris Chris Langton, and uh, the uh, uh, the discussion was, um, you know, how can we create true artificial intelligence? And it's still valid. How can we create true artificial intelligence when we don't quite know what intelligence really is at the moment? So, so one branch of computer scientists uh, uh, decided that, okay, let's not create uh, an artificial mind. Let's start a little bit more primitively, a little bit more simply, and instead uh, try to create a simple cellular you know, one, two cell organism uh, as a digital entity and then put it into sort of uh, into, a, you know, a, a silicon substrate, which would be instead of putting the, the organism as a, a biological entity into a glass Petri dish in a science lab, let's create a digital organism in a computer, like a computer virus, if you like, and then let it evolve and mutate and pass on its D DNA to other organisms, digital organisms. And that, that kind of like blew my mind open. I thought that was in incredible because the, the implication is that if you, uh, if you uh, do that and you let the program run for 30 million years, then potentially those simple micro digital microbes can evolve into uh, uh, more complex uh, entities in the same way as you know depending on your your appreciation and understanding of evolution we we sentient human beings began our uh, existence as, as microbes probably in a distant long vanished ocean beside a sort of underwater volcano as a simple uh, amino acids. And then here we are in a web webinar uh, with, with our ideas and our, our, our works and our, our loves and our passions. But, uh, you know, to get here, we, we pass through that. And I, I'm kind of interested in algorithmic art from the point of view that I believe it's an extension of that evolution, that it's, it's a way that uh, ideas, not humans, but ideas uh, transcend and become more complex. And uh, um, that that kind of thing. And if you know, if an hour goes by and I haven't uh, written some computer code, I get a bit kind of jumpy. It's it's um, uh, and if anybody out there is sort of you know beginning to do this and pick up you know um, uh, this as a as a, a a way of communicating to, to the world and speaking with the world, whether you call it art. Uh, and I think Daniel said really nicely it's 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 more like a performance or or a recital in a in a strange way uh then then you know good luck
So that's it. Perfect. And thank you, Charles, as well. I think this is, again, going to help us jump in straight into this conversation. And my first question for both of you, um, I wanted to start with the first question is, what is generative art to you and how do you define it? Um, so moving forward for the audience, we have a baseline um, for our conversation. Oh, for Daniel, me, I think you're oh, on mute. Oh. Okay, I guess I was going to say that, I mean, generative art is, you know, very simply put, uh, algorithmic art that's uh, art that's coded, that is behavioral, that uh, doesn't have a beginning or an end. It's, uh, you know, basically constantly changing, uh, ephemeral, um, very difficult to kind of experience other than just something that is happening live. Um, um, and I perhaps not the best person to, to, to give it a, but that's, that's how, how I, how I, um, kind of define it. I mean, I think that one of, one of the interesting things for me as an artist, um, is, <clears throat> and I guess an artist that's very kind of maybe more connected to contemporary art than to media art, even though I'm very often kind of associated with the media, you know, the media art world, and I guess I am in many ways, but um, I'm very interested in connecting generative art to art history and how it belongs to this kind of larger narrative of, of art history and how I am discovering as we go along that there's so many things about generative art that um, are feeding off the kind of experimentation that happened in the 60s and 70s where artists were beginning to leave the, the white cube and were beginning to go outdoors and do action art and performance art and land art and uh, video art, of course, came in at that same period using photography and ways that were kind of documenting things that were completely ephemeral. That is kind of where we are um, kind of as artists um, kind of feeding off from. And in a way, all this, this history kind of seems to kind of have gone underground a little bit for, for a few decades where, you know, again, painting and sculpture and maybe even installation art had become very predominant. But all along there's kind of, um, you know, media artists have kind of been uh, working um, perhaps, um, you know, I don't want to say completely underground, but definitely not in the eye of of the general art world. This has all been going on, but we we have not really gotten the the recognition or attention that other other kind of manifestations of art were getting. So um, I'm very interested in making that connection and 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 how how uh, how it is important, I think, to to understand uh, how we do belong to a very important <clears throat> branch of our history. And um, so, yeah, tr let's let's bring code into art history. That's kind of one of my missions. Perfect, and that's a great um, answer. And why I asked that question, and we'll move on to you, Charles, in a moment, is there's so many different answers to what is generative art, um, and it's not quite contested. But a lot of people throughout art history have provided different definitions, and we'll get into that. But Charles, what does generative art mean to you and how do you define it? Uh, I think for me, it's, um, it is centered around, uh, for me, it's, it's centered around the use, specific use of the microprocessor in, as, as, as defined by the word computer. Mm. It's, uh, it's, uh, not exclusively, but is strongly represented by the word code or computer code, the act of writing code, um, editing, creating, uh, borrowing, uh, subverting. It's, it's about, uh, uh, sp uh, sp for me, a specific uh, skill set. Uh, the um, Favorite algorithms are for me are, are sort of nonlinear genetic 
um, algorithms, algorithms which have the ability to, to mutate uh, where the information, the, the starting condition of the, of the system is not, uh, uh, the, the end result is not uh, limited by time and the let's say the result of the computational process is uh, holistic. It's the result is greater than than the input. Um, uh, a little little bit of context. How I got there uh, is the, the the one moment in art school when I got when I got really interested, and I think Daniel sort of mentioned something similar was from art actually from the. 1960s, 1970s, where uh, artists began, stopped, you know, conceptual uh, or minimalist artists stopped actually kind of creating sculptures and paintings and instead cr created a, dis a description of the artwork or, or in some cases just a, the artwork would simply be a set of instructions written down on a piece of paper and exhibited in the gallery. And uh, I got very interested in that. And for me, that's when the sort of light bulb went on in my head when I realized my computer programs were actually just a, a form of uh, con uh, conceptual art. And uh, so, yeah, so code, 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 more code. Wonderful. And um, I want to play to the art history aspect that you've both talked about, because I think generative art, a lot of people today um, with the boom of NFTs and the boom of the internet have just kind of focused in on that. But generative art has such a legacy, specifically to the 1960s, um, when, as you said, Charles, a lot of artists were moving out of that white wall institutions. Um, a great example I always give is like Saul Lewitt um, is yeah. often cited as an amazing generative artist. Um, not because he uses code, but he uses a system. And a lot of people define generative art as the use of an autonomous system, not necessarily a computer today, even though today yeah. we often connect both. Um, my next question is, both of you are multidisciplinary artists. How important do you think that has been to your generative art practice? Um, yes. And Daniel, um, could you start? Because you have such a great background in film and photography as well that feeds into these artworks and the use of code. <clears throat> I don't, I guess I don't need to unmute myself. Um, yeah, um, I guess <clears throat> one of my particular interests is the layering of analog and digital. I'm very interested in kind of where we're coming from to, to really kind of uh, capture and kind of wrap my mind around where we are. Um, I don't like thinking about these uh, kind of technological developments in a vacuum. I'm very interested in understanding kind of the legacy systems that kind of brought forth, uh, for example, generative, generative art. So yeah, there is definitely, um, uh, you know, uh, a flirtation, I would say, with photography and with with, you know, experimental cinema. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the texture and the grain and the, the noise of, 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 of kind of analog media. Um, and so I, I'm, I am, just because of my age, I, am, I was kind of, you know, started out as an analog artist and kind of had to reinvent myself uh, into the digital, um, you know, kind of dove into the digital in the 90s and kind of um, at that point in the 90s didn't ever look back, but now I am looking back a lot and I am wanting to kind of create, create that, that bridge. There is something by the way that really, I, I like to kind of also um, perhaps backtracking a little bit to the previous question and, and, and uh, you know, Charles really made emphasis on the idea of writing code. And this is, this is very interesting because generative art algorithmic art is very much about writing as opposed to, you know, capturing with a camcorder or a, you know, 35 millimeter film camera or whatever, and then editing, which is much more kind of 
uh, kind of visual, but there is something very fascinating about the writing aspect about generative art that gives it, I think, a very interesting flavor. And um, even just the way, because I have edited a lot of video and for my own artwork um, and, and film, of course, is uh, something that's, as you were saying, I think is very present in my work, but, um, but, you know, when you're editing a video uh, and then you kind of review what you've done, there's something very kind of constructive. You kind of, there's these building blocks that you kind of, you know, you order and cut and shape and there's something very fragmented about that. But the behavioral aspect of generative art from this writing, and then you kind of need to kind of listen to how it speaks to you. And you have to sit for a long time, hours, days to see how that behaves. That is new for me, at least. That's just, and, and this is usually what would happen is that after we're coding, my team and I were coding, and then maybe after dinner, I, I go down to my, to my studio and I, so let me just let me see how this is going. And, you know, suddenly it's 3 a.m. because I've been watching its behavior for hours. And, and then it's like, ah, oh, this is not quite right. We need to go back to the writing. But this aspect of, of like the, the written part that, you know, text based part. And I always say that I feel that coding will there'll be a category, you know, Nobel Prize you know, instead of for like literature, there'll be a coding. Uh, it is an it is an incredible art. You know, the art of coding is is something that is is just kind of unbelievable. The language of the future, for mm -hmm. sure, that generations to come will, will hopefully will be. You know, everybody will be learning in school. But uh, that I just wanted to emphasize that I thought it was very interesting the way Charles kind of was talking about the writing aspect of it. No, and I, I completely agree. And also this kind of raises a great point about language with encoding. You can also, I want to say, be multidisciplinary with encoding because coding is vast. Um, and Charles, I'll ask this question to you as well. Can you talk about um, the elements of coding? Like you specifically talked about C++, but that really differs from other languages such as Python, Solidity even, um, and JavaScript and PJ5 and processing. There's different techniques. Um, can you talk about the multidisciplinary aspect of your practice, both in like different mediums and also in coding? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um... The, the one starting point to answer that is uh, when, when I first, you know, finally created, or when I first created my first sort of generation of, of code-based, what I would call artworks, this is in the uh, 1990, early 90s, uh, you know, I was really excited about, this is brilliant, this is great, this, is, this feels like what I want to do, you know, it's, after many years of being a bit of sort of frustrated student artist, I suddenly it was like I could breathe. I, I found my language. So, you know, I said, okay. And I was showing my first works on, on a basically, a, you know, a 1990s VDU computer screen. And I was like, telling my friends and audience to come and come and look at this. And then the first thing that struck me is that only, a, you know, a finite number of people in, in 1990 could gather around a computer screen, you know. So, I, so then I had to sort of use my traditional um education as an artist about well i know what i need i found in my medium i found my voice but how, how do i communicate it to uh give uh, an audience uh, access to this how do i make them feel as excited and as impassioned as as i did without scaring them too much uh, and so then uh for the next sort of 10 years uh i spent l looked at different strategies using pa uh, ink on paper trying to find a way that would uh uh, allow me to communicate the, 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 what I felt was the potential uh, of, of this medium. And, you know, and, and with, and, you know, I was showing it to people who, 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 you know, were barely familiar with video art, let alone, you know, code-based art. It was, you know, I was a bit of a freak, I think, still am, but anyway. Uh, so uh, through, I think through, for me, the, the sort of, Evolu strongest evolution was with the accessibility of video projectors where where you could I could you know get the artwork off the screen and and introduce it into into uh, physical space as as installation and and again those 
installation skills, sculptural skills that I'd learned as a as a student, you know, came in in very handy. So I th I think you know I, I I'm a bit sort of schizophrenic in a sense. On, on one hand, I, I live in my mind. My you know, I, I, I've gone to the point where I don't necessarily need a computer anymore. I can write the code directly in my head. Uh, you know, I can see it. It has, we talk about different computer languages. They, for me, they have uh, taste, like a, I taste the language or, or, or I smell it. It's not like a, a mathematical, you know, logical thing. It's actually very physical. And um, the only, you know, the, the, you know, if I could write everything in assembly language, I would it would be completely you know crazy and a waste of time but it's the primacy of getting that close to to this mysterious strange system that sort of keeps you awake at night that you want to go inside of and discover and understand and you know break into you know hacking in a sense um and i you know for me and i think daniel described it as well it's you know for i think generationally we're kind of about the same age, similar age. And I think for us, we, we sort of saw the, the computer, this sort of beige box with a, a couple of buttons on it and, you know, you know, want to shake it and find out, find the little people inside. Uh, now, you know, the algorithm, as you said, is, is you know, omnipresent. It's, it's around us. It's, it's uh, in, in the phone, cell phones that we carry. It's in how we interact with the, the cash out desk in the, in the, in the supermarket. It's, in the surveillance cameras that surround us it's you know the algorithm and the data sets are you know everywhere but but for me i think to keep some rationale on it it's it's this this box and uh so yeah i mean just uh, you know i i live in my mind with the code uh but then there's part of me that has to be acknowledged it's part of it, that it's part of a physical world where, where you know there's tactility and objects and we 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 and that's how we human beings uh, dance with the world. We we put ourselves inside this vast algorithm, and and we engage with it, and we manipulate it, and we unconsciously add to it and subtract from it. And I think what artists like myself and Daniel and others are trying to do is to raise the the public's awareness that they are actually programmers, coders in their own right, and we're just sort of peeling off the thin veil that lies between the realities we in inhabit and our and our interaction with the that yeah yeah that's it no and you use a couple of words i keyed in on is like dance and this comes back to um in symbiotic as well um comes back to one of the questions we had earlier on about the performance element of generative art and Daniel, I would like for you to speak specifically um, about this connection because you wanted to speak about it earlier and there is a performance element to your work, artwork as well. Um, and same with yours, Charles, and your installations specifically, um, we'll get to on institutions kind of projections. But Daniel, would you speak about the performance element? I mean, yeah, it's it's the unpredictability of it, the surprise, you know, kind of, the surprise element of, of seeing things on the on this occur on the screen that you could never had imagined, this kind of automatic poetry. Um, I can, you know, think of a few examples that kind of gave me goosebumps when, um, for example, there's this other project that I didn't show. It's called Loom. It's a generative artwork that uses uh, the words. It's kind of a very Mark Rothko-esque composition. It's created with the words that are trending on all the Google platforms. And so again, it's it's like this kind of current events or what at least what's on people's minds in terms of what they're searching online is kind of used to create these very kind of painterly compositions. I remember this moment when I was working on this during, during the kind of the the lockdown, the COVID lockdown in 2020, the spring of 2020 is when I was kind of digging deep, deep with this work. And then the, the Black Lives Matter kind of demonstrations kind of exploded. <clears throat> West. And, um, so this artwork just was basically, there's this moment, it was like this kind of dark red background and these kind of um, large uh, um, acronym BLM that was kind of, just um, almost like just 
slowly came onto the screen and it's kind of like fuming, <laughs> kind of burned through the screen. And I could never have predicted that. It just kind of happened and it just kind of blew me away. And it was gone before I could even take a picture of it or record it because of this kind of ephemeral nature of these. So this is, if that's not performance art, the kind of using the elements, the elements that are kind of there, you know, and 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 letting the algorithm combine them in sometimes extremely kind of beautiful, unpredictable ways, I think is is something that is very interesting. I also wanted to point out before we move on to other subjects, how, uh, you know, we are tinkering as artists with these kind of societal trends towards generative algorithms, towards machine learning, all artificial intelligence. These are major, major issues that are kind of whiplashing society and, and citizens of every kind. It's affecting every aspect of, of our lives will do more and more increasingly. And I think it is so important for us artists to be tinkering with these technologies, to be kind of bringing them to our realm, to, to making them a little more complex than they are. I just got back from, um, from teaching a workshop last week that was about art and algorithms. And my students, um, we're constantly referencing this uh, Dali and crayon and all these kind of algorithmic creating, uh, you know, you know, text text based algorithms that create images that um, are actually really fascinating. Um, they're also kind of frightening, uh, and I never thought that you know it seems like um, algorithms and uh, you know robotics were are kind of challenging so many different professions. Now it seems like programs like Dali are really questioning the role of the artist in the future when you have um, algorithms as kind of kind of creating these incredible, um, you know, images. Um, so if, if people don't know this, they should look it up. You know, you introduce it, you can get it on your phone, you introduce a text and the algorithm after about a minute and a half creates these images and the text could be as crazy as you want. We actually use Dolly now as a brainstorming tool in the studio as a, as a kind of as a, almost like, I don't want to, I hate this word, like to create mood boards is what people are using, but we, I don't like that term, but in any case to kind of get inspiration. But this is definitely something that uh, we as artists need to tinker with. We need to, I mean, in a way I'm kind of a little bit, um, yes, I'm challenged by it, but I also don't want to kind of uh, shy away from it. And I want, I want to tinker with these technologies. I want to be part of them. I want to, in my own little small way, influence them. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And then to you, Charles, how, um, what does this performance element to, me, to you mean? And specifically, a lot of your work that I'm familiar with, familiar with is these large scale projections on buildings and institutions. And what is that performance element um, when you take it necessarily out of a screen viewing and kind of put it into the real world? <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, uh... In a sense, it's all about interface uh, for me. Um, you know, traditionally, if you think of a cinema and, and projection and projected light in a box, we're, we're told that, uh, you know, we shouldn't get in front of the beam, but we should go underneath it. We shouldn't, our shadows shouldn't become part of the, the, the experience. And, uh, and some of my earlier works using projection were kind of like that, putting projectors in a traditional cinema kind of setup. And then, then I realized that uh, actually, no, it's the, the I, I saw how people like to somehow bathe in the projection. And I'm, the kind of elements I project, is it's not like a, a movie or a film. It's usually just a few characters or, or some words. They're, they're sort of like, you know, they're like entities separately. So um, uh, I, I noticed how pe it was so curious watching how people in a darkened space, uh, installation space, would give themselves permission to, to um, position themselves. And I, I go back to the word dance with, with the artwork, that uh, they would pick up a few words on, on part of their body and, you know. And then I realized that, you know, as powerful as my computers are uh, and as, as, as complex as the processing language that I'm using is, 
it's not as complex as a human human kind of consciousness. So I, I kind of realized that in order for my artworks to 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 really transcend the the, the sort of micro microcosm of the computer or the algorithm and enter the world, then I that then I need an audience. They become a vector for for the code. So so I try to create these kind of you know there's a fine line between my artworks and a nightclub basically it's, it's very hard to tell sometimes you know so I, I try to offer this kind of enveloping uh, curious space where your identity in the darkness is you know slightly lost and that you can be a different person in there you know culturally doing this kind of these kind of projects in different cultures interesting to see how how um, it's you know art has this wonderful ability to give people um you know private moments and secret spaces and you know i for me i i, I um so i i give this sort of i create the space and in return i i get people's attention so i make a kind of a connection between the computer program and and uh, the human human consciousness so the computers the people's minds you know become part of the computer sounds a bit strange you know so so I, I see myself as a kind of a conductor, you know, in a, in a sense, and orchestrating um, a symbiotic relationship between the art, artwork and, and the audience. And the audience, especially now that they have cell phones, you know, they start taking pictures of themselves and, you know, positioning them, their friends. And, you know, so then the digital artwork, the algorithm goes in the cell phone and, the, you know, escapes the, the, the specific space where it is. I mean, the, uh, the way I talk about these things is, is very kind of like simplistic in a sense, because it is very simple. In a strange way, this is what we do with painting. This is, we've done this for, for centuries, ever since we, you know, put a hand mark in a cave wall uh, uh, in, in the infancy of, of, of humanity, we've, we've, we've we've had this this dance going on and um yep yeah. so you know that's that sort of kind of thing the just also getting out also i wanted to get out of the artistic kind of institutions i want to get out of the white box of the of the museum because it was a little bit like preaching to the converted you know already you know i'd, I'd you know they were going, clapping going yes this is terribly interesting there was a, a, a little bit of interest in the early 2000s in, in digital arts. There was a sort of sense in the kind of, let's say, classical art world, the art world that sells paintings and has galleries and is usually centered in the Western world. There was a sense, oh, yeah, we, we need to invest in this. And then, then it kind of uh, petered off very, very quickly because I think it became a question of, actually this kind of art is so cutting edge that it's not like a painting that you can hang on the wall it comes with a lot of complexities of conservation cura curating communication preservation more there are more questions with this sort of algorithmic art as a as an art form than there are answers at the moment and that's why i love it this is my my place amazing and thank you it seems that we have um we have 15 minutes left and we also have a few questions from the audience that have popped up that i just want to raise so the first one is thank you so much for all sharing i am so fascinated by the organic nature of generative art the mutation the learning the behavior and how it enables us to interpret data in a completely new way how do you see the genre of generative art developing and what lies in the future of generative art Well, maybe I'll <clears throat> I'll pipe in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm one of the things that um, in my own practice, I've kind of had the fortune of collaborating with scientists, and that seems to be occurring more and more often. And so, um, a couple of years ago, I did a project with a microbiologist, and we um, for this project, I had to really kind of think about uh, genes. And uh, I'm working on another project now with a cosmological uh, uh, computational cosmologist actually and one of one of the things that I'm really understanding I mean uh, genetic coding you know are basically switches that go on and off and all the kind of the millions of variations that are allowed in this kind of genetic code of a living system are basically ones and zeros and all the different ups and downs of, of a switch on off on off are very connected to um, programming 
to coding. So there is something kind of fascinating for me that we're kind of from the very back end of generative coding. We are flirting with how uh, biological living systems um, grow and evolve and die. Uh, this is um, for me kind of where, where the kind of the miracle or the kind of the fascinating evolution of computation is behaving and kind of almost becoming, I would say, a, a kind of a living system. This, of course, we're seeing with machine learning and artificial intelligence and so many other evolutions, but um, I'm very interested in kind of understanding how from technology, we're perhaps going to the roots of living systems. <laughs> and I think there's that's kind of where the future lies in many ways. And then Charles, same for you. What do you think is the future of generative art and the use of algorithms as well? Uh, I, th I think that it's, um, as we increasingly become, you know, part of a, a digital information based cultures, uh, we, we artists and the role of artists using, using or having access to the uh, computational um, systems of interpreting data uh, we 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 have a role to play that we we have we're a little bit like the antidote in a sense to this this you know radically developing and changing landscape of artificial intelligence and blah blah blah, blah algorithms. We need uh, and and the, I, I I'm I I was somehow like born this way of you know how the 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 universe spits out uh, somebody who's you know got uh, you know likes to paint and draw and you know get get messy but on the other hand is also can, can code that that's just a an accident of the of the universe and I think that happens in in, in every culture there uh, will be the predominant technology and then there will be a kind of an antidote to it. A, a bunch of individuals are, are, are born uh, with with a skill set that is is able to a little bit kind of uh, move more freely within that that system. And I, I hope that I mean for me it's code and the ability to write code. It means it's a difference between a, a user and a creator. Uh, it's very and I, like I said, it's a bit weird to be. It feels a bit strange to be me and to be able to write code and then to enjoy to do that, and and also to be coming from an artistic visual visual arts ba background. And I'm not quite sure how 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 I think it's a good thing, and I I wonder how that you know how we can get more people to be creators rather than sort of users of of, of algorithms and, and code. Uh, Maybe it's just some people in the same way that some people can just sort of paint and they have this sort of, or draw, they have this hand to eye coordination that other people kind of don't have and who do stick fig figures as the most advanced drawing that they come up with. Uh, I, I just, uh, I would look and I would hope that, um, that uh, it's a necess necessity that we have, we have a, a generation of, of artists who, who can use access the, these algorithms and the way of creating them quite fluidly and fluently. How, how that happens, I'm not quite sure. Uh, if, yeah. I would just like to um, <clears throat> second that. I think that's a really important point, Charles, that uh, at a societal, societal level, uh, we are all kind of spectators of, of these technologies. And as you say, users, but also we just kind of consume them blindly. And I just also think that it is so important to be able to creatively tinker and respond to them and process them and digest them in a way through our own hands and heads and you know keyboards or whatever it is. I, I, I think that's a crucial, crucial point you're making. Yeah, and I definitely agree. And I think this comes to like a lot of questions people have been having about the role of AI, which is another can of room worms that we might not have time to get into today. But um, one thing that a lot of people who aren't as familiar, uh, we want to end on this, um, familiar with generative art and algorithms is the use of randomness um that's like imbued into these works that you as creators might not always be able to specifically control 
And I'd love to end with the question of, do you see this technology as a new tool medium or do you also view it as like almost a collaborator um, in that sense and kind of leave it with that question? I love that. I, I, um, I mean, in a way my generative arts um, is probably the most composed art I've ever made in my life as it was such detailed kind of, um, shall we say, uh, yeah, so much detail and it goes into the coding. It's incredibly subtle. You know, you, you, you literally it's kind of have to structurally go into the very heart of, of these behaviors to make them happen. So they can be very composed, but yes, definitely then there's that kind of element of randomness that that is also very kind of very surprising and very beautiful. It's a kind of a mixed bag. But I, I do love the idea of thinking of, of, of my algorithm as my collaborator. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's very, very um, I like that very much. I, I would to totally subscribe to that. And what about you, Charles? How do you view this um, communication relationship? Uh, the, um, the first, just to sort of, you know, that magic word randomness, it's, it's, it's a good one. Um, uh, it's some, something, it's a, something, I'm not quite sure. I can't put it clearly into my uh, words, but there's something about this sort of the predicted potential heat death of the uni universe. We're actually talking about, um, thermodynamics when we talk about randomness and about, you know, and the second law of thermodynamics gives gives the uh, our, our reality its its feeling of time of time passing. Um, so I think I think uh, well, at least with my art, and I think with whether you're a painter or a sculptor, you're playing uh, with a writer, a musician. You're playing with randomness continually. You you know what as a creator or the instigator, you know what the parameters are that you begin the system with. In the same way as the, the theatre director knows where the actors are going to be, what they're going to be doing during the, the, the performance in, in the theatre. Uh, but nobody can predict how the lead actor crosses a stage, you know, whether they trip over on the way or they have a hangover from the night before and they forget the lines or the, or the lead or the lead um, lead violinist, you know, a, a string snaps and, and they adapt. And, and again, it goes back to the sort of, you know, recitalness or, or art as a concert, uh, the algorithm as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a, a fluid and adaptive thing. It's about, uh, it's about writing the computer code is about asking questions about the uh, universe and, and receiving answers. No, definitely. Um... And I think for the audience that I want to express as like for the moderator is these both artists are great examples of how vast generative art is. And um, it's just a new kind of, it hasn't really had its place in art history fully fleshed out yet. Um, meaning that we've had art historians really been focusing and keying on these um, relationships. Uh, we do have one last question, um, kind of about the input output relationship and the idea of constraints. Um, generative artists have the endless supply of information that they can use. Um, do you feel like you have to have structure or boundaries in, in order in your artwork? I mean, yeah, I'm, and definitely. Um, I mean, I not only am I using generative art, but I'm also using live data that's coming in and feeding the artwork, which creates this other layer of randomness too, because who can predict what's gonna happen in the next, you know, today or tomorrow, or, you know, looking ahead. But um, because of that randomness, we do need to shape it. I need to shape it. I need to give it, I, I need to set a stage for, for, for this randomness. In a way, I feel like I'm kind of literally, you know, setting the stage and the, you know, the background and the, you know, the lighting. And then, um, so uh, yeah, if not, you get lost, right? You know, you need a certain kind of tension or structure to kind of uh, shape, shape uh, the, the randomness that's coming in. So um, uh, yeah, as I, as I just said earlier, um, it's, 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 very, it's actually very composed, you know, there is a lot of compositional elements in my case. 
it's not just like this work that just happens automatically. You just press a button, go. No, there's just so many months and months of work <clears throat> that go behind uh, all these all these projects. And then for Charles, um, for you, Charles, do you put any parameters or boundaries in your artwork, and or and do you think there should be? We'll end on that. Well, it, it's um, to go back to something Daniel said earlier about uh, like how we, how I understood it. Um, he was sort of positioning himself, or or he understood the the sense of you know being called a media artist, but maybe not necessarily either feeling or or somehow looking in the mirror and seeing him, himself as a media artist uh, and rather maybe as a, as a, you know, more traditional artist who happens to be working and investigating this field. And I think, I think the, 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 the boundary that we're really all talking about here and what the, the, the art fair presents is, is art. The art is a boundary art is because I'm not quite sure if what I'm making with these algorithms is, is art. Uh, it just so happens that, uh, through through the the personal development and relationship with art, I've I've decided to call it art, and we've all agreed to call this art an algorithm. But it doesn't necessarily mean it is. But to me, you know, the Western canon, late modernism, postmodernism, uh, white middle aged guy with a computer kind of with an art background is is a boundary. It's not like uh, uh, how, that that defines how people approach the art, what they already before they see my artwork, what do they think? You know, they, they're going to see an exhibition. It, it has some art in it and the art is, is algorithmic based. They have a set of assumptions and presumptions before they even see the artwork. So th those are the boundaries I think that I, I feel I'm working within. If I was a computer scientist working in uh, behavioral, you know, algorithms for, for Google, then, you know, the, the, the boundaries would be, would be different, much more strict, probably more goal orientated. Uh, here, it's more like blue skies in this, in this, in this room. <laughs> well, amazing. Um, thank you both Charles and Daniel. And I think you've both expressed the amazing kind of world of generative art mm -hmm. and how vast it can be. And for the audience, the digital art fair, um, this is just the beginning. Um, there's great history to generative art, um, but as well as the future is quite, um, we're developing it as we live in our relationship with technology. So there's a lot to come as well. So thank you both. And thank you to the Digital Art Fair for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank, a great, great moderation, great questions, Abigail. And it's, um, I've real honor to share some thoughts with also with, with Charles and the two of you. So thank you very much. It's been, been a great conversation. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.